played the game as if he were hitting the beach at Anzio. He swung from the heels and shot for the moon and led his army on a charge down the fairway. He was the best of 1950s America, strong, confident, almost recklessly democratic, and with the virginal eye of television following his every golfing move, he took the game public. He was golf. He literally picked it up on his shoulders and carried it to the people. It had been a game of the martini swilling country club set, and he, he gave it to the beer folks. Oh, he really let it out. A tremendous belt. Oh, th there's Nagel's ball, and way, way past it goes Arnold Palmer's drive. He was the every person's sort of favorite. Smash it, crash it, get on with it. You know he's going for it. Look at that. He was going to go down swinging, there's no questions. He took chances that nobody did, and most of the time he brought them off. The line is perfect. He's got it. The reason that people loved Arnold Palmer, Palmer didn't always win. When he did win, he would do it dramatically. Hello. Arnold Palmer breaks the record for the British Open. But if he didn't win, it would be equally as dramatic. I wonder what Arnold is thinking. I don't want to say he doesn't have talent, because he does, but he has probably achieved more from just strict willpower. In Arnold's early years, Arnold was not a good driver. And he had to take these aggressive shots out of the trees and out of the woods, and he kept making them. And, you know, people loved him, because he won doing that. He enjoyed the intimidation factor. And Arnold uh, would hit some shots and almost as if say, OK, can you top that? There comes a bold Palmer putt. And there it goes. Golf was, was, was not a, uh, anywhere close to being a major sport, uh, certainly not a, a television sport, uh, certainly not a sport that the masses uh, were interested in, until along came Arnold Palmer, the, the common man. Here he comes, he made it. He looked more like a, a college halfback coming down the fairways than a golfer of previous days. The first shot we took of Arnold, coming over the brow of the hill, and he walked up, flipped the cigarette, hitched up his trousers, drew up his nose, gave it a couple of snorts. That was his style, pure blue collar. Palmer's virile all-American image gained legions of admirers with each tournament. Some were fresh recruits for a hardcore contingent tabbed as Arnie's army. It was exactly like playing with a rock star. I want to tell you, your ears were actually hurting you with all the screaming on the tees. I mean, I mean that. His popularity was gained by the fact that every spectator lining the fairway thought that Arnold Palmer was looking at them. This guy is standing at the edge of the green, and his wife's saying, he's coming, he's coming, he's right, and he's, the guy's getting a little angry. And he's saying, what is it with you? And she looked at him, and she said, watch the way he hitches up his pants. I think Arnie's army uh, was heavily populated by, uh, by females who put it that way. Knowing people are, uh rooting for you and are aware of what you're doing uh, always helped me. Uh, it always made me want to perform more. Arnold Palmer was the next step after Joe DiMaggio. It's about having a good time. It's about enjoying oneself. Uh, it's about being what seems like a full, open, American man. He won his first Masters in 1958, but it was not until two years later at Augusta that he nailed down his role as golf's leading man. Down a stroke in the final round, he drained a 27-footer at 17 to tie. On the par 4 18th, he struck a near-perfect second shot. Here it comes, the five or six iron. The ball on the green, and within approximately three feet of the pin, a magnificent shot by Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer is the master of 1960. He has birdied the last two holes. With millions watching on TV, Palmer became an instant celebrity. Arnold Palmer. Open, Arnie again generated high drama. 
mired in 15th place down seven strokes after three rounds he didn't flinch after the morning 18 and a couple of newspaper friends is sitting there and he asked one of his friends a newspaper guy from pittsburgh he said what would it take to win this term and the guy said uh, well forget about it you haven't got a chance farmer said watch me he birdied six of the first seven holes finishing the front nine with a record tying 30. his 65 was good enough to win two strokes better than talented amateur jack nicholas the 1960 U.S. Open in Cherry Hills in Denver was, was the epitome of Arnold Palmer. You know, driving the first green and charging back from was it, seven strokes to win, that's not normal stuff. Palmer's dreams of a Grand Slam expired when he finished second in the British Open. But by the end of the year, he had spiked the still waters of golf with red-blooded drama, winning eight tournaments. It was the perfect marriage for a sport and a magazine that needed to woo the working class. Sports Illustrated fell in love with Palmer. This was a tally-ho magazine, and Arnold Palmer was their tally-ho guy. Even the White House wanted a piece of Palmer's action. Ike may have been president, but Arnie was king, inheriting the throne from Jones, Sarazen, Sneed, and Hogan. Now the challenge was to stay up there on the wire. Sports Century's 50 Greatest Athletes is presented by Katerra. Think Zig. Also brought to you by MasterCard. There are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. By 1-800-COLLECT, the easy way to save. And by Budweiser. Now is the perfect time to enjoy a brewery fresh, beechwood aged Budweiser. Now, play to win with a new Wilson Staff Ball. This is the famous long ball that Arnold Palmer used to drive 346 yards to the green and win the 1960 Open. In 1959, a young attorney named Mark McCormick walked into Arnold Palmer's life and changed it forever. He was very uninterested in those days in business. Then I said, Arnold, why don't you let me do all this stuff for you and you just concentrate on playing golf? And he said, well, great. As odd as it may seem today, nobody was uh, doing that in uh, the uh, early 60s. The year before they joined forces, Palmer made $20,000 off the course. But with McCormick now handling his TV and radio exposure, exhibitions, endorsements, and investments, Palmer became a millionaire and president of his own company by 1966. It took a long time before I could accept the uh, fact that Arnold Palmer was a product. You can get more golf and leisure hours in by using the time-saving new Porter Cable Green Line Power Tool by Rockwell. Arnold has this wonderful crossover appeal. He's a conservative Republican. Yet, had he gone into politics, my guess is that the steel workers would have loved him. Palmer's working-class roots were authentic. Born in the western Pennsylvania steel town of Latrobe in 1929, he grew up in that sunlit no-man's land between wealth and work for hire. His father, as all golf pros were at the time, were treated like second-class citizens. Arnold was not allowed into the clubhouse uh, that belonged to the members he served. Uh, Arnold was not allowed into the dining room, nor was his father. I used the golf course when uh, there was no one else there, where my mother would take me out in the evenings after all the other people were finished playing. I wanted to perform and show my father that I could play golf, and he was proud of my golf and proud of what I was doing, but he never told me that. Golf won Arnold a scholarship to Wake Forest University in 1947. He enjoyed college life until his senior year, when his best friend was killed in a car accident. No one had identified them, and they asked me to do that, and that's probably one of the toughest moments uh, of my entire life. Part of my life uh, was wiped away. He was just devastated. Uh, you know, he didn't want to be in school anymore. So he left school and joined the Coast Guard. I think the three years that I spent in the service were very good for me. Uh, I matured. I got over a tragedy uh, and prepared myself for uh, the rest of my life. Fresh out of uniform, 
Arnold was back on the tees, winning the 1954 U.S. Amateur. And one of the most thrilling matches in the amateur's history goes to the 24-year-old son of a Pennsylvania golfing professional. On the wings of that victory, Palmer turned pro at 25, and while his game took shape, so did a public persona that found life while in the service. When Arnold was in college early, he was so competitive that we did not see his charisma, and Arnold's sense of humor was not obvious. Then after Arnold was in the Coast Guard, Arnold was exposed to Bob Hope and a number of celebrities, and Arnold was very clever to, to see what he needed to do with himself to, be, to develop his people skills. That's Arnold Palmer waving out the window of the captain's room here at Old Troon to those 15 or 20,000 people who refused to leave him. He was always responsive to the crowd. I mean, he was a pretty, you talk about a movie actor, he was a pretty good actor. He knew how to get the attention and how to get the crowd revved up. He became very aware of television. Was the first one, I believe, that was aware of where the cameras were, paid attention to where the cameras were on the green. The Arnold just teen his ball up and, and Jack came up behind me and he said, watch him when the red light goes on, you know. He looked down at the, uh, the flag like it was the enemy and then he hits this tee shot. Give it the old, you know what, at the end. Uh, and the ball runs up five feet from the hole, you know, and the crowd go nuts. Jack looks at me, I look at him, and we both shut him. And that was Arnold. I never thought about playing the crowd. It wasn't something that I thought I was doing. My intention was to show off, if you wish, uh, that I could hit a golf ball. And if that is showboating, then maybe it is. But that wasn't my intention. What happened in there? Your drive hit the tree. Well, I lost so many in there, Bill, that I, uh, actually, that's probably one of the greatest sixes I've ever made. He was very, very good in that he remembered people's first names, so he would say what he was interviewed. Well, Bob? Well, Jim, one of the reasons I like to come is you saw in the 18th green. Oh, so he had, he had the media at his feet. He's been accessible to the media, and he's had a great respect and appreciation for what the media does for the game. So as a result, he's been treated with kid gloves. He was moving in the golf world, which protected him. Uh, and he was highly protected by Mark McCormick and all his business interests. A lot of people made an enormous amount of money riding along in Arnold Palmer's golf cart. Who's going to tip it over? You look at Arnie Palmer from afar, and you say to yourself, this is a pretty good guy. I might want to have a beer with him. Then as you get to see him in press situations where you're talking back and forth, you realize that he's extremely controlled. I think one of the reasons he holds so tightly to his image is that he doesn't know how people are going to react to him if he steps out of that character. Arnold is very conscious of the way people feel about him, and he works very hard to cultivate his image. And he understands that part of his success economically lies in the fact that people like him. He's not phony. I think he feels he has a duty to preserve the image that he's worked hard to build, not so much out of vanity as out of responsibility. My dad needs people a lot. I think they are his lifeblood. It's what he thrives on. A benevolent man of the people, he wasn't always gentle as a father. I think he felt he had a responsibility to be really strict. It wasn't so much that we had, you know, a, a lot of rules. It was when the rules were broken, there were huge consequences. He used to say he would like us to be scared of him. If I put it the way he puts it, it sounds like child abuse. <laughs> you know, we were afraid of him, but we respected him, and he was very loving to us and very, very physically and verbally affectionate. In 1962, a chink in Arnie's armor showed glaringly in the U.S. Open at Oakmont Country Club just outside of Pittsburgh. The challenge came in the callow, rotund form of a certain 22-year-old rookie. Here comes this young guy who everybody just started to call Fat Jack. How dare he challenge the king? Arnold Palmer is the king. In his own backyard. It was this Thanksgiving butterball uh, who came walking out of Ohio State and he looked like he had a down comforter thrown around his middle. I really didn't take him uh, seriously. I knew he was a good player. I knew he was going to be a factor. But I didn't uh, worry about that. 
paired with the king for the first 36 holes, it was immediately apparent that the two-time U.S. amateur champ would not be intimidated. Here you have this rookie on the tour, necklace, uh, uh, playing with this, uh, with this godlike creature. Yeah. Nicholas was so scared he started on the first day, birdie, birdie, birdie. After two rounds, Nicholas was three strokes off Palmer's pace, and Arnie's army was camped on every green. Every steel worker who had the day off in Pittsburgh came out to watch that tournament every day. They made noise, they hollered, they shrieked, and when, when Nicholas tried to putt, it was very distracting. When he'd line up for a putt and fighting down to the line against Palmer, one of Arnie's army would look, would look over to him and say, miss it, fat guts. Good gracious, I mean, I'm here, I'm as a, you know, crew cut, overweight kid, uh, knocking the ball 60 miles down the fairway, beating their hero. I wouldn't be very happy with him either. They gave Jack the business. He didn't like it. It was something that only motivated him, only pressed his button a little bit harder, made him want to play a little harder, and would have done the same for me. In the final round, Nicholas made up two strokes, catching Palmer and forcing an 18-hole playoff. The king was in for a fight. I'm the champion. This kid's come in. I give you a couple of my best shots, and you don't even blink. You don't even go, oh, 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 I might have got something here that's a bit, uh, a bit hot to handle. Nicholas took control early in the playoff and led by four shots after six holes. Despite a charge by Arnie and constant sniping by his army, the rookie sensation dealt the king an embarrassing loss. That was a bitter defeat for me. That was one that, uh, that was in front of my folks in my hometown, and, uh, and it hurt. In July, Palmer bounced back, winning the British Open with a record 276. Two years later, he became the first four-time Masters champion. But Nicholas was charging, capturing the Masters in 65 and 66. The rivalry had grown personal. What do you think about tomorrow? Do you think you have uh, still in position to have a good chance to run at it, or what? Do you think you have a chance tomorrow? I think so. Well, I think I have a chance <laughs> okay. tomorrow. There was always a studied tolerance between them. When they spoke publicly, when one guy said something nice to the other guy, you, you're saying to yourself, he's saying this because he knows we're listening and he knows he's supposed to say it. They began to hear from each other's camp some of the things that they were doing. Arnold uh, getting up from the breakfast table and telling his buddies that, uh, with a big grin, hey, I'm going to go take my necklace now. Or uh, if some of us happen to wear a, a necklace shirt with the golden bear on it, Arnold would come up and he'd grab that and he'd say, what you doing wearing that pig on your shirt? Here is Arnold Palmer, the most beloved golfer of all time, who knows in his heart that he's not the best. And here's Jack Nicklaus, who may very well be the best golfer of all time, and known that he's despised, despite his incredible talent, because he overshadowed the beloved Arnie Palmer. Palmer began showing signs of slippage. In the 1966 U.S. Open, he blew a seven-stroke lead with nine holes left. A year later, he went into the last round tied for second, but lost by four strokes to Nicklaus. In late 1969, Sports Illustrated bid farewell to an era. Palmer never won another major. We are very competitive. We will always be competitive. And I don't think we would like each other if we weren't. I always said one thing. I says, you know, I may have had to fight Palmer's gallery, but I never had to fight Palmer. They became friends, and uh, they are still friends. But there's still a little bit of a gap between them, and always will be. outlived everything but hasn't won a tournament since 1988. Has Arnold Palmer stuck around too long? Sports Century's 50 Greatest Athletes is presented by Seville STS. With all the power and technology of the North Star system, it's what's next. Also brought to you by Lincoln Financial Group. Lincoln Financial Group, clear solutions in a complex world. By Burger King, 
where you can have the delicious king of fries. Burger King, when you have it your way, it just tastes better. And by Nike. Arnold Palmer won seven majors, 60 PGA titles, and 10 senior events. When he reigned supreme in 1960, there were just over 6,000 golf courses in America. By 1994, there were almost 15,000. A historic arrival. Let's enjoy it. That year at Oakmont, Arnie led his army up the 18th fairway in his last U.S. Open. When you walk up the 18th and uh, you get an ovation like that. I guess that uh, says it all. I don't think he thinks the ride is over until he's six feet under. I think he'll do whatever he has to do to stay in it. With $20 million annually, the King stubbornly remains among the top athletes in endorsement income, despite not winning in the 1990s. Arnold has been pumped up a little bit, but then again, he deserves it for the way he's been able to handle not only defeat, victories, people. He's always been a class act. You little guys playing golf today, playing by all this money. Every one of them should go up to him and shake his hand and thank him. Look at the patience he had with people with autographs. I mean, people just swarming on him. I mean, he's been so wonderful for the game. I used to accuse Arnold of carrying a pair of uh, army binoculars around so he could look and see if anybody else needed an autograph. Nobody ever enjoyed being who he was more than Arnold Palmer liked being Arnold Palmer. In January 1997, Arnold Palmer was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Three months after surgery, he was back playing in the Masters. When he had the cancer operation, oh, huge concern in uh, all the golfing countries in the world. Great concern because uh, Arnold can't be that frail. He must go on forever. Arnold will never die. If someone said, well, now, here it is. This is the end. Uh, you can go on from where you are. Or you can go back and do it again. But you have to do it exactly the same way. I'd like that. In the summer, Arnold lives in Latrobe, near the country club that once excluded his father from its inner sanctums and young Arnie from the course when members were playing. The Palmer family pretty much has the run of the place these days. In 1971, Arnold bought Latrobe. We will see you next week when the 50 greatest athletes of the 20th century continues its countdown with number 28. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com, a part of the Go Network, go.com.